So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, round table in conjunction with the Olafur Eliasson exhibition Baroque Baroque, which will open tonight at the Winter Palais. And uh, we have Olafur uh, himself in the, in the panel and uh, two very illustrious guests, uh, Miriam Schall, who is a professor of aesthetics and cultural philosophy at the University of Applied Science in Hamburg, and Aurélien Barrault, who is a French physicist, philosopher, specializing in antiparticle physics, black holes, and cosmology. We'll moderate the talk, Daniela Zeman, who is chief curator at TBA 21, and with me was the co-curator of the exhibition itself. Good evening, enjoy this. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us here in this wonderful Baroque um, environment. We are proposing to discuss today the question of world making, of creating worlds from various perspectives, from pers perspective of astrophysics, of philosophy, of the history of ideas, of the history of thought um, within the Baroque and outside of the Baroque, uh, with the history of aesthetics and the production of art. So various angles and various point of views of how to talk and think about making worlds. Um, will be free-floating in this space of Baroque thinking, free-floating and folding one idea into the other is probably permissible. Um, but we start with the matter, with the dark matter, right away. We, I would like to ask Aurélien um, you know, to explain to us and to talk to us a little bit about worlds, many worlds, multiple worlds, and their dark, dark sides from the point of view of astrophysics. Good evening, and first of all, forgive me for my Frenchman English. I will try my best. So, I'm supposed to be a scientist, and especially a cosmologist, someone who tries to understand something to the universe. What are we doing as scientists? Well, of course, defining science is a very complicated question that I will not solve with you today. But one might naively argue that science is, first of all, a link with mathematics, this is correct, but this is not completely true because human sciences do not use mathematics and because even within natural sciences, neither etology nor taxonomy use mathematics. Well, one might argue that science is basically what is looking for the truth or maybe what is telling us the truth. This is also, I think, very naive. Because, you know, each time there is a change of paradigm, that is, a change of description of the world in physics, for example, the ontology is completely redefined, which means that if truth exists, and this is probably something we can question, we are somehow always infinitely far from truth. So one might then argue that science is rationality, logos, as would say the ancient Greeks. But you know, rationality is very ill-defined. We are all the irrationals of our opponents. So, in my view, I would say that science is first of all a kind of tension, or maybe a kind of discomfort, as would the Portuguese poet Fernando Pessoa say, between, on the one hand, creativity, because a theorist is a creator, he invents a model, but, on the other hand, a kind of implacable factuality of reality that cannot be circumvented. I mean, nature is not only the mirror of our soul, but neither it is something which is just given to discover. We have to face it and therefore to invent it. I think that the first gesture that we should choose as scientists is humility. What does the universe look like? Maybe you want me to answer you this question. I don't know. There are many different answers. We have to be very humble. For example, our eyes just see a teeny part of all the possible lights. If you look at the sky with light of low energy that you cannot see by, by your eyes, but which do exist, you see something completely different. You see a gas of galaxy in the radio frequencies. 
If you look in the microwave frequencies, you see the Rayleigh radiation from the Big Bang. This is completely different. If you look in infrared frequencies, you see the environment of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. If you, look in, if you, if you see in ultraviolet, you see the relic elements from the Big Bang. If you look in X-rays, you see very hot objects like white dwarfs. And if you look in gamma rays, you, for example, discover something like a pulsar which emits relativistic particles. My point is that all those faces are real, although they are all different. There is no privileged single face of the universe. I have just said about a pulsar emitting relativistic particles. You know, relativity is really the key theory for us because it teaches us something fundamental. Space and time are, can be exchanged one into the other. It teaches us that travels in time in the future are possible. All of us could become older than our parents if they are still alive. We know how to do that. We don't have the technology to do it, but we know what should be done. And furthermore, relativity teaches us something very important, I think, also for an artist. You know, E equal MC squared. It means that a property, the energy, can be changed into a being, the mass. This is something fundamental which completely deconstructs the usual ontology. And this is what we are doing, for example, in a particle collider. We are transforming motion, speed if you want, into existence. We are not creating ex nihilo, we are creating ex motion. From motion, we create new particles. We can use those particles to discover new faces of the universe. For example, consider neutrinos. Neutrinos are ghost particles. They can travel through the stars and through the intergalactic medium without being altered. This is fundamental, because when you look at the sun with your eyes, you just see the surface of the sun. We see a skin of star. So I know the French poet Paul Valéry, often cited by the philosopher Gilles Deleuze, was saying that there is nothing deeper than skin. But in these particular circumstances, there is a nuclear body, which is exactly what you want to see. One could also use cosmic rays, for example, to search for antimatter. Is there, are there Icelands of antimatter in the universe with right now anti-artists discussing with anti-scientists? That's possible. We don't know. And finally, I have in mind what we call gravitational waves. They are reels of space-time. They are vibration of the, the, the geometry predicted by the great theory of Einstein. This means something fundamental. This means that space and time are not anymore as Kant or Newton would have thought the place where phenomena take place. It means that space and time are themselves phenomena. They are evolving. They are dynamical. The expansion of the universe is just the motion of space in itself. Of course, there are problems. We are able to say something about the history of the universe, but problems are consubstantial to scientific and, I think, to artistic thought, thinking. We don't know what happens inside black holes, where probably space and time exchange each other. We don't know what is dark matter, most of the mass of the universe. And we don't know what is dark energy, which is the origin of the very curious acceleration of the expansion of the universe. And even worse, we don't really know what it means to have a Big Bang, what it means to have a beginning of space and a beginning of time. Even worse, are there other universes, what we call a multiverse? We don't know if they exist, and we don't even know if this question itself is well defined. I think that those interrogations are not orthogonal to the ones of Olafur Eliasson, and this is probably why I was invited tonight. For several reasons. 
First, because, um, and this is probably something that is important in this Baroque environment, we are all playing with light. Light is a tool, but it is more than a tool. It is our access to reality. Maybe it is a quintessence of reality itself. Why is dark matter so strange for physicists? Not because it has very strange properties, but just because it does not emit nor reflect light. Without light, we are lost. Second, because, uh, because I mean, we are all interested also, I think, in the dark side. And this is especially meaningful in a Baroque environment. If I can refer to the famous classification by Wolflin, one of the characteristics of Baroque times for him, where, when opposed to classical times, is that in Baroque painting, darkness is not only, as in classical paintings, a way to guide the eyes toward light. Darkness is also something in itself. Darkness, the dark side, is valuable, is meaningful in itself. And this is exactly what we discover as physicists. And third, probably because the, um, the French painter uh, uh, Soulage, probably one of the masters of black color, said, and I think that the work of Olafur, of Olafur Eliasson shows that, what is in between the work of art and our eyes is part of the work of art. I think this is especially meaningful for an artist like him, who, for, for, for whom it is important also to consider art outside the museum. And for a physicist like me, who discovers, thanks to Einstein, that space is itself a physical object. And finally, to conclude, and probably most importantly, because I have read that Olafur Eliasson calls sometimes works of art reality-producing machines. I absolutely love this sentence, and I cannot agree more. Because, you know, sometimes science is described the other way around as reality-discovering machine. And I disagree with that. I think, like him, I am also a reality creator. I think, and on this point, I would follow the words of the American philosopher Nelson Goodman. I think we are all world makers. We are all making, inventing, constructing symbolic systems, but with different rules and with different constraints, of course. I think we are fundamentally deconstructing the very idea of a ready-made reality. So, in my mind, this is slightly more than a touching point between us. This is maybe a condensation state, and physics teaches us that those states can be followed by big bangs. Thank you. Thank you, Aurélien. So before I ask the anti-artist to reply to that, I would um, ask the anti-philosophist um, maybe to ponder with us for a moment on the question whether making worlds is always a remaking, whether making worlds also always starts from our world here and now, and is actually um, a matter of composing and recomposing the elements um, of our world. <laughs> Well, Daniela, what you're saying is exactly what uh, the great Baroque philosopher Leibniz would say. He would say, um, we should not think of creation of um, the new deriving out of nothing. The new is a new combination of what is already there. And these combinations are infinite. It is an infinite world of possibilities that can be recombined. And so... The effect is new, but the elements are very old. And this also gives us, in a way, trust into what is new. This makes us accept the newness of it, I'd, I'd say. Maybe a few words on Leibniz and um, the way he creates his universes inside. Yes, I think Leibniz is, is very important for the whole Baroque uh, ideas. He, um, of course, as a philosopher, was also an engineer, which is quite interesting. So he really invented things in law. He invented uh, coal mines. He invented a calculus. He was even um, an inventor in, in cal calculating machines. 
So he was very prolific in what he did. But for this um, situation and room here, he had an, a direct con contact to Prince Eugene, which is interesting enough. And in the end of his life, uh, Prince Eugene asked him to put his metaphysics short in order to make it comprehensible to the prince. And so Leibniz um, broke down his metaphysics, which is very interesting because it is a conception of multiple worlds um, from the very start. Because Leibniz was very aware that we have, he was writing in French, petite perception, that we have, um, that we know things without knowing it, that our perception um, deals with vibrations and with things that do not uh, mean anything, but they are there and they can become meaning, meaningful. So the whole, he had the idea that every soul is in touch with everything which happened before and what is going to happen. And this, of course, is a beautiful means of linking and uh, overbridging, of course, differences and uh, trying to bring the universe together. And one thing he was particularly interested in are uh, mirrors, and mirrors bring us back to Olaf Eliasson's work because it is the main intervention in the new exhibition that we are followed and awaited by mirrors in every room. There is one, a big oversized mirror that is also um, inhaling, moving. It is not a, uh, it is a film, it is a, it is a movable, uh, a vibrating object. And uh, for Leibniz, the, the mirror does not, has nothing to do with self-control, it has nothing to do with vanity, it has nothing to do uh, with the fugitiveness of time. It has to do with completion and perfection. So the mirror is uh, a machine, it is a Baroque machine, it is a tool to complete and to decentralize the human gaze, which would, without the mirror, could never be completed. And, and I would uh, invite you to see the mirror as a means for completion and to get to know that perfection in the Baroque was something doable. It was something that you could attain with skills um, and with deliberation. And it is very fundam a fu very fundamental idea in striving for perfection. Thank you, Miriam Olafur. Um, maybe two ideas I would like to pick up from Aurélien, two of the many, um, and I hope I'm, I'm, I'm not over into it. But one is the movement of perception, right? If, you, if we look at perception as this ability to sort of uh, rescan, reinvent, reorganize, um, re explore, and um, you know, our environments in all its multifaceted ways. And then the other is the idea of order. I think ordering, systems of order, also you know, the way that we, we represent color in the color uh, spectrum, the way we represent temperatures and so on. So in, in some ways, these two elements are so important in your work, as I see. Are they, are they sort of tools in, in creating worlds and um, artistic processes such as the exhibition that we have? Yes, thank you, and thank you for having me, and hello, everybody. Um, wow, such good company I'm in. Um, Excellent, excellent. The, um, the, the, the perception as a kind of reality machine or as a kind of constructing element, I think is a, is a healthy exercise in terms of, I think we, in our numbness, take it for granted that reality is real. And not that there's something wrong with it exactly, except in the moment you would like to change it. Uh, make it better, maybe, or, or, uh, or so. And this means that, uh, of course, the idea that a changeable reality is, a, I think, much more healthy, as it also suggests that the people in it are, in fact, the protagonists who are making it. And obviously, we are also surrounded by systems, political systems, or you know, commercial systems, or, or various systems, who seems to profit from suggesting that reality is not really negotiable. Because if it's negotiable, it can change, and this means that it's destable, de and so on and so forth. So for me, perception was is to kind of look into the structure of perception in this way is also really about investigating well to what con to what um, to what extent can we actually allow people to sort of take over the production of reality or reality as such. I mean, who owns it in terms of uh, 
Is it something that we consume, that we are surrounded by, and then we take it in? Or is it something that we produce? And it's obviously still surrounding us, but it is something which is consequential of how you are in it. And for an artist, or in, in terms of art making, I think it's, it's, it's a, uh, you know, this idea of that reality is relative is, is really also a critical uh, mean, because it's, I think, is about also exercising trust and, and, you know, suggesting that people are actually smart enough to sort of take over their own reality and produce their own reality. And as we know that museums, for instance, are very much evaluating to what extent do they trust the people like you here tonight? Do we trust you to actually make sense of how you come in and use and make real what you see in the museum? Or do we need to assist you and speak? And now it's interesting. We think we speak on your behalf, but actually we speak on your expense, right? And, and this is the question of whether reality is something you produce or something that the museum produces for you. So I think this is... Um, the first, the sort of perception, um, and now I forgot the other question you had. Uh, more about order, order and systems of... The yeah, the, quest, the, the order question, I, I actually um, thought a lot about how to put the mirror into the exhibition, which I hope you will have a chance to see uh, later. But in the show there is a very large mirror uh, that sort of goes through the exhibition, it's very long. Um, one should think that by doubling the space as one think when you put a mirror in a space, one should think that it would create more. But what I think seems to be happening is that there is less. Because first of all, you took away the wall that is behind the mirror, so you don't see that. You don't have to deal with you know, one out of four walls, so now you have taken 25% of the space away, so there's less material, you could say. Luckily, that is the wall where all the windows is and the outside, so I also have eliminated this, sort of the concept of the exterior. And of course, what I thought was so interesting, uh, because this kind of uh, decentralization of the human gaze, my, what a lovely way of saying it, was what we see in the mirror is of course uh, not a, the double of the space in which we're standing. We actually see the space in which we're standing from the outside of the space. And this is why it's so dis interesting, because so it's not a reflection of the space. We are seeing the space in a third person point of view with us in it. Right? And we all know that we can't see ourselves normally, right? I can't look at, I can't like, look at myself, right? I can see my hand, but I can't see myself in the space. Something interesting I'm sure could be said about this, but you know, so, so in a way, suddenly the mirror allows for something that we would otherwise not be able to see. And that's why it becomes a machine. It allows us to see something which is real. And in the process of doing that, it introduces a, 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 an order, it's always such a, you know, um, yeah, for an artist that's never really a nice word, but you know what I mean, the, the, point is, the point is it does introduce an ability to see or surveil maybe, if it's like order, your own gaze from the outside. So you both see into the mirror, but you also see yourself seeing. And I, if I can just finalize that point, so this type of introspective seeing is like two perspectives at the same time, right? I both see and I see my seeing is also, I think, where we find identification. Because this is the moment where we actually can allocate the space an ability to hold us in it. So we allow for the space to see us from the perspective of the space. Suddenly we have on in terms of um, ontology, I guess. You, suddenly we can see ourselves from the outside. That's not how I wanted to say it. The identification point for me is more psychological because it seems to suggest that the space has a certain ability. You could give it a certain agency or performativity. You know, we could call it hospitality. And you can suddenly in this moment also start to talk about, well, what spaces execute what force or order on us in its way to hold us, right? So hospitality is, agent, is an agent, and it is an agent which has intentionality. A space is never just a neutral holding thing. It's always a producing reality machine, if you want, just like we are. So there is a meeting up between 
different trajectories, the one of us and the one of the space. And the space also has intentions. This space, as you can see, is totally full of intentions. It's and so on and so forth. And this, I think, is, I always say this at the end of every sentence since I came to Vienna, this, I think, is very Baroque. <laughs> and then, finally, I just went, what a great title. I will call my next show, Without Light, We Are Lost. That's a brilliant. <laughs> yeah, so. I think Miriam wanted to comment. Um, yes, what is so striking is that these huge mirrors do not only show us, it shows a multiplicity, it shows a community yet to come. What I found, they have a very, a, you call it hospitality, I would call it more neutral, a social aspect. It is an uh, invitation to gather. Uh, it is an invitation to become somebody else. It is an invitation to do something, even as strangers who meet together in this space. And I think this was very obvious in um, the weather project, when people tried or started to form words out of their bodies while they were lying on the bottom of the uh, turbine hull and were starting sending messages uh, in, in verse letters and yet years before Twitter came, came up. So I like this idea that these oversized mirrors offer the idea of a community to come and of a, of a, a better people to come. I think it's, it's an invitation to to think about future and to think about being guests on this world. Aurélien, would you like to comment? Or yes, with pleasure. <laughs> um, uh, first, Olafur, I remember the last time we met, you wanted to borrow from me, space is gravity. So I would be delighted to give you titles for any, any, any future work of ours. I'm you to are be a, honest about a that. title machine. <laughs> okay, more, more seriously. Um, just a few, yes, a, a few words about Leibniz, maybe, because, uh, of course, he, he is a, an incredible uh, philosopher, and when we think about multiple wor worlds, uh, his name comes immediately. But in Leibniz's view, I think multiple worlds are somehow virtual. There is only one actual world. There are possible worlds, but they are not actual worlds. I think in the history of philosophy, maybe in the ancient times, people like Anaximander, or at the Renaissance time, people like Nicolas de Cuse, Rabelais, or Giordano Bruno, and even in contemporary times, people like David Lewis or Nelson Goodman, for completely different reasons, of course, might also be useful because they probably have been deeper into the idea of multiple worlds that are real, that are actual, that are consubstantial, and of course, most of them are not somewhere else in a metric sense. They are not 1,000 kilometers away. I mean, what is the distance between a poem from Rimbaud and a poem from Baudelaire? You just cannot measure it uh, in terms of length. They are just not the same. So most of those multiple worlds are somehow Parallel worlds, this term should be taken with care, but I think this is an idea which is very, very important. Also, about order, I think this is something fundamental because, you know, I'm supposed to be a cosmologist. And cosmology is a conjunction of two, two words. One is logos, so logos is rationality, but initially it was also language and even oral language. And the other word is cosmos. And in ancient Greek, Many um, words have, are, 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 have different meanings. For example, cosmos is both the universe and it contains an idea of order, which means that order seems to be consubstantial to the very idea of the universe. And I think this is something we are right now trying to deconstruct. Maybe I would like to define myself as a chaologist and not only as a cosmologist. Because we are trying to learn, and I think art is helping us a lot here, also to deal with disorder, I mean to make sense of disorder. If you look at most, uh, most sacred or texts or most um, uh, histories of the universe, either the Bible or the Theogony of Hesiodus or the Metamorphosis of Ovid, etc., it always begins by order. Because before order happens, 
there is nothing to understand. There is nothing to deal with. The order is somehow the other name of the world in itself. This is maybe something we are just trying to, to, to change right now. And just a final, uh, a final word about um, ontology, say, um, of course, we're not going to solve this huge question tonight, but I, I think the key point about uh, what Olafur is, uh, is uh, saying, and what you are saying too, probably, is that um, what is our fundamental ontology? What are the fundamental objects we are deciding to deal with? Of course, there is something which is not our decision. I mean, the stars are probably, will be probably there even if we all die tonight, which, which I, I don't hope so. Uh, the stars will still be there, for sure. But the reason why we call them stars might change. This is the point. You know, the, the world has been thought as a collection of things. Then it has been thought as a collection of state of affairs. And maybe it's also time to, to consider it as a collection of relations. I mean, the answers are most of the time somehow objectives, but the questions are our freedom. And I have visited the exhibition of Olafur this afternoon, and it was completely clear to me that he has created a huge number of new questions that would have never come to my mind without his works of art. So in my mind, he is not a creator of matter for sure, neither am I. He is a creator of new questions. And then reality gives the answer. <laughs> Thank you. Olafur, you've also um, worked obviously a lot on, on senses and the ability of our senses to perceive. We talked about that. But how do you see sort of new neuroscience and neuroscientific exploration and research and abilities to, for instance, enhance sensorial experiences? Do you think there is a future of world making in our ability to extend the ability of the skin, for instance, to perceive more or more intensely elements of our environment, the abilities of the eyes, the earring, you can go endlessly. Um, I know neuros uh, neuroscience is, 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 is very close to your interest. Um, can you explore? And yeah, I think it starts with understanding that the senses, all of them, are to a much greater extent than we think actually cultural products, or you know, they have been cultivated. Of course, we are born with some biomat some biomatrix uh, and, and so on and so forth. But generally, uh, I would like to suggest that the way we sense our surroundings is a, is a big construct. And if you ex accept that, this sensory contract can also be modified, right? So I think the senses are not likely to change unt until we actually focus on them and or you could say deconstruct them if you want, and then reconstruct them in this new modus. And of course, art and culture in general is somehow always and has always been about the kind of recomposing of the sensorial contract. I think, in my case, I've been looking more on um, the sort of social neurology that has to do with empathy patterns and compassion-based and inclusion systems, and to what extent uh, and under what conditions can we actually share, for instance, a space. The debate about public space, you know, is public actually inclusive or exclusive? Uh, and, you know, of course, there's a political or socio-political dimension to this, a social scientific el element which has to do with societal uh, kind of um, constructs of senses, too. Um, I think this idea of suggesting, well, people are actually capable of ad enhancing our senses also fundamentally has to do with that we generally don't use our senses so much that, that maybe without thinking about it, we have become numb. And it doesn't really take a lot to sort of challenge this numbness. I mean, we have become numb because everybody's pre-digesting everything for us, so we don't have to think. And we have also, for instance, become numb to the, non the things that are harder to quantify, such as temporality, right? So we think then when looking at, you know, a landscape that we can see how big it is, but it actually turns out once you walk through it, the scale becomes explicit by physical activity through temporality or uh, through time, right? So we all know the feeling here in the, in the mountains. You look at the mountains and you wonder whether it's a big mountain far away or a small mountain closer by. And then you have houses and trees that makes it easier. But when you, like me, go to Iceland where there's nothing and it looks like the moon, you can really, or even better, maybe Greenland because it's so big that it's hard to understand even. You stand there and you look and you are 
not just able to tell the scale, you are also not able to tell how big your body is, right? So it's not just what I'm seeing outside, it is the way that the outside is also not telling me if I'm here. So this is remarkable and it's a kind of a mirror again. But the moment you start to walk, you realize, oh, this stone is actually coming closer to me quite fast and the other stone is not moving. That must be a big stone far away and a small stone close by. Meaning that the walking itself becomes a reality producer or the time it takes for me to walk through the landscape. And suddenly by, by walking or here in the mountains, I realize not just how big the landscape is, I also realize, oh, I'm actually existing. I'm here uh, because I wasn't sure. And of course, if we are so this has to do with senses in terms of kind of uh, uh, the sort of muscle, muscle knowledge and how our muscles, you know, actually are also our eyes or our ways of confirming our existence. So, um, and I have I've been, uh, you know, focusing a lot on what does it mean to physically know something and what's the discrepancy between actually knowing in theory and also talking about it, right? You know how it is. We always talk about things that we are going to do, but having said it five times, it already feels like we did it and then we don't have to do it, right? So, so actually, sometimes we make the mistake to think that the action about the climate, maybe, is something that is dealt with once we talk about it, right? I'm talking, 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 but I'm actually not really doing anything. So art, again, of course, I also always think art is amazing, but art is very much about connecting, thinking, and doing, because you start with an idea, Step, model, sketch, bigger sketch, model, bigger model, computer model, ask a scientist, ask a curator, and then you have action, right? Actually, the journey is, of course, the action and so on. But you see how creativity, you could say, has been about connecting, thinking, and doing. So the numbness I was talking about, the lack of physical knowledge or the sensory knowledge has to do with that we think that thinking about things is the reality-producing element. But a good test is just to stand in a great Icelandic landscape and then you realize, oh, I probably don't even exist because I have no sensory contract to stabilize my, or to prove my presence. Um, so that's my relatively pragmatic relationship with neuroscience. Thank you. Hola. <laughs> Thank you, Lavo. Um, Miriam, can, can we think outside of our bodies? No, uh, one, one question. Second question, uh, maybe more about Baroque thinking and Baroque reason. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe sort of this idea that reason not necessarily is like this black matter that is all about order and being extremely well organized, but maybe reason can have... I yes, got I got it. <laughs> we should never think outside our bodies. Never ever do it. If it, this happens to you, you're in a very bad situation. I mean, this comes to traumatized people that they suddenly see themselves from above, or uh, women under labor do, do see themselves from above. And I can tell you from my own experience, this is a really a threat mill. This is really a threat of, you, you, you know that something utterly is not in place in this situation. So please stay in your bodies, think in your body, be sensual thinkers. This is, I think, a good thing to do. So, second question, rationality in the Baroque. Um, what is, there's a new book on Baroque, Baroque science by two Israeli scientists. Um, one is called uh, Chen Morris and the other one is called, um, I forgot actually his name. But it is very interesting because it says that in the Baroque era, of course, the science which we know today started to separate from philosophy. And they started, of course, to estrange themselves from the tactile world. And what is interesting that at the same time the Baroque uh, artists were, uh, particularly the use of optical elements in Jan Vermeer, you can see the, his use of the camera obscura, it's very interesting that he um, embraces the new technology and he uses this to um, revolutionize his paintings, his painting style. So he tries to imitate by painting effects he has first seen through the camera obscura, but the effect is to, even in embracing the new science and even in embracing the rationality of the camera obscura, he links it to tactile experience. 
And this is very fascinating for me. So again, the artist is the one who bridges the gap. It is in the Baroque era the one who says there is no divide between rational and irrational or essential or abstract. They make the abstract visions of the camera obscura, of, of, uh, camera obscura tangible, touchable. And this is so fascinating that they bridge this gap. So um, what we think, when we think in these opposites, the Baroque era is always thinking it together. They don't see it as... Uh, and they like to make the construction visible. For instance, this illusionary um, painting over our, an our ceiling. Of course, if you stand in the middle of it, you get the full effect. There is an ideal standpoint from which you see, have the, the, the best of it. But if you stand from a look at it from one of the sides, when you enter this room, it seems to be anamorphic and distorted. And this is not an accident. The artist knew that there was also an anamorphic aspect, a, a disruption in it, and he would be happy with them too. He was happy to, to show the constructiveness can, of can his I, can, paintings. Can I just add to that? Because I think this is so interesting, not, not to cut you off, Miriam, but, but for me, that is a proof that the Baroque artists actually trusted the people to be smart. Right, so that's something we can learn from, right? So, the, so they did this crazy painting. I mean, look at it, it's totally crazy if you think about it. I mean, the, the, they must have been mad. And they think people are so smart that they just put the painting and do nothing else, right? They didn't have a, a sort of a headset to put on people to explain it. Do you know what I mean? Not, not, nothing against headsets, but, in, but you get the point. But I, so, so it, it hands the responsibility for the creation of the painting to the viewer. So it reverses this idea of the viewer consuming the painting to the viewer producing the painting. And I, I just think this is very interesting because the cultural sector uh, seems to be one of the few places where this type of trust generating principle is supported. Not all the time, but it's just interesting where, where we think uh, the cultural sector, we actually think people are smart. Aurelia, I have a question. I mean, I have a question to you, but I'm, I'm happy if you weave it into all kinds of speculations, of course, and, and, and replies. Maybe you can just say a few, a few yeah. words before your possible question. Uh, uh, you have invited us to stay within our bodies, and I completely agree, of course, with the argument. And I think this argument is also another way of inviting us to be very modest in our relation to the world. Because stay in your body, I think, also means move our body. Because if you move our, our, your body, you change, of course, the perspective. Um, and I think you might say that changing the perspective changes the world. You might answer, but the world has not really changed. I have just changed my mind or my view about the world. Correct. But the meta world you are referring to here is probably testless. This is an empty world that you don't want to fight for. So probably the world which makes sense, which means the one you are in relation with, the one you are fighting against or fighting for, is indeed changing when you move your body. And finally on this point, the French philosopher Bergson was saying, my body is going up to the stars. That's a strange sentence, but that's not a crazy sentence. Because actually, it is correct that the border of our body is somehow arbitrary. Let's take it the other way around. I might ask you what is the radius of the sun, and if you remember, you will answer me a certain number of kilometers, something like, I'd say, I don't know, 700,000 probably. But you might very well say that we are right now within the sun. It completely depends on how you define the sun. If you define the sun not by matter, but by its magnetic field, for example, which is completely real, completely measurable, then the Earth is within the sun. So I think that we can view ourselves, probably philosopher, artist, scientist, as body extender, extensions to the fundamental body. We don't want to leave our bodies, and actually, we cannot. 
leave our bodies. We must keep in mind that we, are, we, we cannot access the eye of God. But we can extend our bodies. And trying to see the world at other wavelengths, other energies with other particles, or like Olafur, uh, do it by asking new questions, I think it's also a way of making hybridations between our body and body extenders. Well, I still have a question. Uh, so what is the body of science? Uh, what is the inside of science? You know, what makes scientific thinking productive in a sense of knowledge production? What do you do with all the mistakes, the failure? How do you delete from science? Uh, from science? And how do you sort of negotiate this delay between science and so society? I mean, it's a group of questions, but you... Sure. Um, uh, Gaston Bachelard, the epistemologist, was saying that the history of science is the history of corrected mistakes. And of course, this is a correct view. We were discussing with Olafur just before the conference, and we were arguing that uh, actually, in natural, not, not in mathematics, but in natural sciences, in physics, for example, we, 